Buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos. Para una mejor experiencia, les solicitamos por favor que mantengan sus micrófonos muteados. Todo el material que presentaremos puede ser utilizado para difusión y promoción. Muchas gracias y que disfruten del evento. Muy buenos días y bienvenidos a otra gran sesión de un evento de prensa virtual para todos y cada uno de ustedes. Gracias a toda la prensa de Brasil, Argentina, Colombia, México y toda América Latina que nos acompañan hoy. Hoy celebramos ni más ni menos que 10 años con American Pickers. Son 17 temporadas y en julio tendremos el episodio número 300. Pero además tenemos una noticia muy importante. ¿No escucharon mal? Sí, todos y cada uno de ustedes pueden grabar lo que quieran. La intención es que puedan usar este material de sus series favoritas para promoverlas, para difundirlas y para hacerlas más famosas todavía. Porque dependemos del apoyo de ustedes para que estas series sean conocidas y reconocidas en todo el mundo, pero especialmente en toda América Latina y Brasil. Y ahora, para presentarles más novedades y más comentarios de lo que debemos esperar el día de hoy en este evento, les presento al presidente y gerente general de AI Networks Latinoamérica, Eduardo Evi Ruiz. Gracias, César. Eh, muy buen día a todos y gracias por acompañarnos como, como siempre por su, por su apoyo. Eh, hoy es un día muy especial porque contamos con dos personajes, dos figuras eh, que son icónicas para nuestra pantalla en History. Como mencionó César, eh, llevamos 10 años con... Eh, transmitiendo cazadores de tesoro a través de toda Latinoamérica. Eh, ya el próximo mes eh, se cumple el episodio 300. Eh, yo me siento afortunado y, eh, y todo el equipo estamos afortunados porque sabemos que son pocos los canales de televisión paga que, que tienen series eh, con una duración y con 300 e episodios. Eh, mucho de esto se debe, eh, obviamente, a a los personajes. Hoy con nosotros van a, estar, van a conocer a, a Frank y, y Daniel. Um, by the way, I'll do a little bit in English just to say hello to Frank and Daniel that uh, soon they're gonna, Mike, they're Mike. Be, uh, Frank, I'm sorry. I, I keep, I get, you know, you know what happened and I'll do it in Spanish. And so, English, you know, but, everybody uh, knows that it's, well, a, it's a live event porque puedo corregir a mi jefe en vivo. It's live. And, You make mistakes in live TV. And, you know, what happened is that I met I met Neil and Frank in an upfront in the Dominican Republic in Punta Cana. I think it probably about six years ago, maybe even more, maybe even seven years ago. And I have never met Frank, uh, Mike. And today's the first day. So, Mike, thank you for being with us. Danielle, uh, my love, always a pleasure to see you and, and to have you with us. Um, we have about... We're going to have about 200 journalists that are all super anxious to ask you guys questions. Uh, we're talking about, you know, your durability. You guys have been with us for 10 years. We're going on episode 300 in Latin America. Um, you know, there's this fascination with making money from objects that are just, you know, for some people don't mean anything and for others, they're very valuable. And I think that you guys started a trend in television when you started with the History Channel in the U.S. and then you came with us in Latin America. So thank you for being with us. I'm going to switch to Spanish now for a second. Y a todos ustedes que, que nos acompañan hoy, de verdad, sumamente afortunados de poder compartir y estar con, con, con Mike y con, y con Daniel en el día de hoy. Espero, les, voy a, les vamos a mostrar un corto video sobre la, cómo comenzó el programa eh, cuando hicieron el, el piloto de la serie y cómo estamos hoy después de 10 años con casi llegando al episodio 300. Así que espero que lo disfruten. Muchas gracias. En el 2010 nació un show que trataba de dos amigos recorriendo la ruta en busca de antigüedades. En cada lugar al que llegaban descubrían diferentes personajes, hurgaban dentro de galpones, sótanos, áticos y despensas, hasta que encontraban algún tesoro para coleccionar, restaurar o revender. Y así una y otra y otra vez. Pero, ¿cómo este programa llegó a convertirse no solo en un éxito, sino en un clásico de History? Echemos una mirada al pasado para descubrirlo. 
Esto es 20 años de History Clásicos. Aquí estamos Frank y yo, conducimos toda la noche por carreteras rurales. El programa empezó cuando, después de viajar mucho alrededor del país, a Mike se le ocurrió la idea de mostrar a las personas y sus historias. ¿Qué opinan? ¿Quieren dar un vistazo? Teníamos una cámara y empezamos a grabarnos. Y fue en ese momento que surgió la idea de un programa de televisión. Me he sumergido en basureros, manejado en callejones, he hurgado en pilas de rocas y objetos oxidados, pero toqué puertas. La idea era muy clara, la trama también, pero había un pequeño problema. Expliquémoslo. Los directivos de History aceptaron la propuesta de Mike, sugiriendo que el mejor lugar para esa explicación era la apertura del show. Viajamos por las carreteras buscando... Oro oxidado. No recuerdo ahora. <risa> la apertura surgió de forma natural. Viajamos por las carreteras buscando reliquias oxidadas escondidas en graneros y garajes. Perfecto. Buen trabajo. Amigo. No lo leí, lo, lo tenía todo aquí. Lo sentiste, ¿no? Oh, sí. ¿Lo sentiste? Muy bien. Con la apertura terminada, llegaba la hora de salir a la ruta a grabar el show. Pero una cosa era grabarse a ellos mismos. Me gustan estas latas, aunque a la mayoría no le gustan porque son grandes. Y otra muy diferente era protagonizar un verdadero programa de televisión. Yo la tomé y tomé asiento un momento para ver cuánto dinero tenía en la cartera. Y él llegó detrás de mí y la tomó. Y le dije, oye, yo la iba a comprar. Y él dijo, bien, se compra cuando se ve. Sea una lámpara antigua, un muñeco gigante de publicidad o alguna colorida lata vieja, todos los objetos a los que estos cazadores echan el ojo esconden la historia de una época que revive en cada cacería. ¿Qué puedes decirnos sobre esto? ¿Dónde la conseguiste? En Japón. Yo estaba en las fuerzas de ocupación. ¿Durante la Segunda Guerra Mundial? Sí. ¿Entonces estuviste allí luego de que lanzaran sí. la bomba? Sí. Cuando viajamos, es maravilloso escuchar tantas historias increíbles sobre estas personas y sus colecciones. Comisionado Gordon, aquí Frank Fritz. Hola, ¿cómo estás, señor Chanel? No creo que se ponga mejor que esto. El único motivo por el que el programa se ha mantenido tanto tiempo es porque se trata de todos nosotros. Si fuese solo para coleccionistas, no hubiese durado tanto. Cuando llegaron a History por primera vez hace casi una década, nadie podía haber adivinado hasta dónde llegaría su éxito. Hoy, Cazadores de Tesoros sigue estando tan vigente como cuando comenzó y ya se convirtió en un clásico de nuestra historia. Bueno, y ahora vamos a continuar con El Estratega. Nuestro VP de Programación y Producción Original para History, Miguel Brailovsky. Gracias, César. Buenas tardes, buenos días a todos por acompañarnos. Hoy es uno de esos días en que nos enorgullecemos de nuestra historia. Cuando History lanzó hace 20 años, eh, nos propusimos esta misión de hacer a la historia relevante y entretenida para toda la región. Y con el tiempo nos damos cuenta que lo que ha logrado ese objetivo es este eh, grupo de eh, extraordinarios que representan esa conexión con la historia. Eh, American Pickers, Cazadores de Tesoros, es sin duda una de las series que nos ha acompañado en la gran parte de la gran mayoría de nuestra vida en América Latina, junto con el precio de la historia y junto con otras grandes series. Y cuando... Vemos qué tienen en común series que han prevalecido en el tiempo durante tantos años, han acompañado como íconos de la programación de History. Es justamente las características personales de estos eh, increíbles personajes que han sido los eh, abanderados, que han sido los embajadores de la marca y de la pasión por la historia durante tanto tiempo. Hay muy, po muy pocas series en la historia de la televisión que se den el lujo de llegar a 300 episodios y estar en más de 10 años en el aire en forma ininterrumpida y es por eso que hoy tenemos el orgullo de, de este homenaje de los 10 años de Cazadores de Tesoros, es un orgullo inmenso a, a Mike, a Daniel, por supuesto, Frank como parte de este ecosistema de increíbles personajes que, de vuelta, cumplen con la misión de History de acercar a la audiencia que tal vez no tiene 
eh, una conexión directa con la historia a un universo que a través de ellos eh, podemos descubrir. Así que sin mucha más eh, introducción me encantaría presentarles un adelanto de los próximos episodios eh, estreno de la temporada número 17 de Cazadores de Tesoros. Mike y Frank viajan. Conocen muchos coleccionistas y llenan su camioneta una y otra vez con objetos e historias. Cazadores de Tesoros. Nuevos episodios todos los martes a las 10 y 35 de la noche. Disponible en History Play y History on Demand. Y ahora es el momento de presentarles al único, al innovador, al creador y ese cerebro detrás de esta serie con esta personalidad inolvidable que lo convierte en una figura y un character driven series que se llama Mike Wolf. Hello, thank hey, you. Mike, how are you? I'm doing very well. Finally, we have the chance to talk. It's a pleasure for us to have you here. So let's go to the point. Once upon a time, you have an idea. You didn't make a pilot. How was the process before it became a series for history? Um, it was a long, lengthy process. I, uh, I pitched the show for five years. And really, when I was pitching the show, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what a treatment was. I had no idea what a sizzle reel was. I was just kind of filming Frank and I on our journey when we were on the road together. Um, I knew it was something special because of the people that we came across and the items that we found, but it was really trying to figure out a way to package the, um, the content in a way that could make it uh, into a television show, meaning a format. So for years, I was pitching the show for five years without a format and never really understanding um, how to create one. Uh, a format basically in television is when you have like all these leaves, but you have no tree. So I had no tree. I had Frank and I on the road filming, but I had no idea of like how to actually package it into a show. And that was one of my biggest difficulties for a number of years and why a lot of networks turned it down. Well, as you know, we have people from around Latin America, from Colombia, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, Chile, who are going to have the chance before we end this hour to ask you the proper questions. However, we have simultaneous translations. So don't worry about the language. Everybody's going to get everything that you're saying. Mm -hmm. Now, we okay. want to know which one was the most oracious thing that you ever found. I mean, the most interesting things for me that I've ever found have always been transportation related, obviously American motorcycles. I've found motorcycles in the past that people didn't even know existed anymore. So if you look at the history of American motorcycles, you know, there were a, almost 150 brands uh, before 1920. So a lot of those companies were around for a very short time. And so there's never been an example of any of them found. So there were a couple motorcycles called Bradleys. There was a guy named Charles Bla Bradley in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania that was making motorcycles. And up, up until the point that I had found a couple of those, no one in the hobby had ever actually seen one. We'd only seen them in photographs and catalogs and maybe read an, an article that was written in a motorcycling magazine in like 1905 or 1910. So once an item like that is found and collectors can put their hands on it, then they can almost study it like it, it's, it's, an, it's an artifact. They can study it like an artifact of American transportation history and learn from it. And then obviously the value of something like that is tremendous because it's the only one in the world at that point. It's so clever that you are able to combine entertainment, business, and history. That's why everybody loves your show so much. But you are you have a partner, Frank. You travel with him for more than 20 years, you are friends. How is that is that yeah. relationship and how good of a road trip friend is Frank after all? 
<laughs> I mean, Frank's one of those guys that you take on a road trip and tell you the same story over and over again, and you're going to enjoy it because um, it's so entertaining to hear it from him. Uh, before the show, I always told Frank, I said, you know what, you could do stand up because you have comedic timing is just something that's not been learned by him. It's just, you know, the way the guy came out of the shoot. <laughs> he, uh, he's a very funny individual. He's got a lot of little quirks and, and, um, and nuances to him. I've known him since eighth grade and we traveled together for a number of years, a lot of years. And, um, we were, we were really, we, we, we had the same passion. But we, we collected different things, which was awesome for us both to uh, travel together because we all we, we each were helping with each we were helping each other with our collections, meaning like I had an extra set of eyes in a barn and so did he with what the, the things that we were looking for. He's got a big heart, he's very funny. Um and uh and um I uh I think he's a huge asset to the show. And we happen to agree. Now we are going to watch a video so everybody can get to know what Mike is bringing for the next season. Érase una vez un niño llamado Mike que iba todas las mañanas caminando al colegio porque su familia no tenía dinero para comprarle la bicicleta que él tanto deseaba. Hasta que un día se encontró con una en la basura. Era uno de los días de sacar la basura y estaba caminando y encontré una bicicleta de niña. Estaba impresionado porque alguien pudiese botar una bicicleta y pensé para mí mismo, si alguien puede botar una bicicleta, ¿qué más podían botar? A pesar de querer tanto una bicicleta, Mike la vendió por 5 dólares y a partir de ese momento nunca más se detuvo. Por eso empecé a revisar siempre la basura para ver qué más podía conseguir. Desde ese día me la pasaba revolviendo a la basura. Mike encontró en la basura la pasión por la cacería de tesoros. Cazadores de tesoros. Nuevos episodios. Domingo a las 11 y 30 de la noche. Disponible en History Play y History on Demand. Mike, but was not enough to have your best friend as a road trip partner. You also brought someone else that you met in a sort of a garage sale. So I'm going to right. present a promo to everybody before we get to the point. Okay. It's about Daniel. So let's go with the video, please. Sí, es Daniel de Antique Archaeology. No suelo recolectar con los chicos. Ellos siempre recorren las vías juntos y yo a veces voy con ellos. Resulta divertido. Me encanta. Me gusta coleccionar antigüedades, burlesque, cualquier cosa de este tipo o relacionadas con el mundo del espectáculo. Creo que es muy divertido. Creo que el óxido te cuenta la historia. Es como cuando hablas con alguien de 40, 50, 70 Tienes una conversación más redonda con alguien que es más maduro. Tiene más que contar. Hay más historia allí. Creo que es la misma sensación. It is about time that someone dares to set the record straight and clarify this situation that have been lasting for years. What really happened with that lamp? <laughs> the garage sale, the lamp, who was the actually the first one who saw the lamp and had the right to keep the lamp? Daniel, go for it. Yeah, both hands up, both hands up. But hey, listen, first of all, Mike, we look so young. We didn't have gray hair or double chins back then. <laughs> That's crazy. I know, it's crazy. You know, <laughs> I know. Yeah, so, okay, let me just set the record straight, okay? We were across the street from my parents' house. You know the one up on the hill? That crazy yeah. brick house they live up on the hill, Mike? Yeah, so we were across yeah. the street from there, and we were at uh, a garage sale, and I picked up the lamp, and I set it down, and he came up right behind me, and he picked it up. And I'm like, hey, dude, that's my lamp. And he looked and he goes, it's not yet the time to buy it. It's when you see it. And that's the first time I ever heard that line. It taught me an important lesson about life. And that was what, probably 25, 
five years ago or something. It was a long time ago. I knew who Danielle was before the garage sale because she was always the interesting, artsy, uh, beautiful girl that would walk around downtown, sometimes skateboarding, sometimes riding a bicycle. And she uh, was was always capturing everybody's attention with um, the way she was <laughs> dressed and just how creative she always was in our little tiny town. So everybody knew who Danielle was. And um, so when I saw her at the garage sale uh, and I saw that she had a lamp, um, I was like, okay, well, you know, obviously I got some competition here. I got to step up the game. <laughs> <laughs> but then you decide to bring so that sparkly that personality, that sparkly personality to the series. So how was your beginning as co-hosts of the TV show, Danielle? How was the experience at uh, the beginning? How was my beginning? I, I don't think yeah. they really wanted me on there. I think Mike was like, hey, <laughs> you gotta have my friend Danielle. She knows some stuff about some stuff. And they trusted him. So the beginning yeah, was well, just Mike pretty much uh, advocating for me and sticking up for me all the time. I mean, the network was great, they're fine. But Mike was always like pushing uh, the idea of me being involved. And um, really, really, he must have sold it to him good. <laughs> Excellent. So we know that you love Latin America and you love tattoos, but your muse happens to be Frida Kahlo. Do you mind to share your tattoo with everyone on camera, please? So my friend Alex Strangler, who's a Mexican tattoo artist, did this this tattoo. Okay, wait. <laughs> Here we go. It's the other side. Yes. This is. Yeah. This is the. I'll try to get it all in there. There we go. It's perfect. Beautiful, perfect. Frida. Yeah. So, so tell us about it. Why you like Frida so much? And why you like Mexico because so much? I was, well, so my father used to do a little bit of missionary work in Mexico from time to time. So I was familiar with Mexico. I'd been there a couple times. Um, and at like learning about Mexico, I learned about Frida Kahlo. My mom loves art and she loved Giorgio O'Keefe and she loved Frida Kahlo. And so I kind of started to learn the history of Frida through my mom because she used to call me little Frida because I was a wild child. <laughs> what? So that's kind of where I fell in love with Frida and Frida's dad was a photographer. So I also have him on this arm. Perfect. Nice. Because my father nice is thing. a photographer. So that was kind of the, the connection okay, to Mexico. Mike. We have to th uh, two questions before we go to the Q and A. Mike, you are, we are about to celebrate the 300, 300 episode of American Pickers. It's truly unbelievable. It's truly legendary. Do you ever, when you have this crazy idea of a pilot, even dream about having 300 episodes in a hit series around the world? Um, you know, before you, you and I started talking, you were showing footage from what I shot when I was pitching the show and footage from the early years of the show. And, you know, it, uh, it's wild watching your life's work, uh, being captured on film of something that you love so much, what you love to do and, and to do it with friends and people around you that, that care. Um, I always thought that it could be a success in the US, obviously. That's why I pitched it for so long and why I stood behind um, it for so many years. But I never in a, in a million years would ever, uh, ever imagine that it would be a success around the world the way it is. I mean, now we're in 63 countries and, you know, here I am talking to you and uh, I, uh, I feel that the show is really, I always say it's a show about all of us because we all love story. We all are treasure hunters in our hearts and in our minds, whether or not we are pickers or not. And um, I feel that um, it's something that a lot of people can connect to because it, it almost, we've created a family and we've, we've shared our, our journey with people and they can relate to it because I think they see themselves in us. You know, me and Danielle and Frank were always the underdogs and um, we always had to earn and fight for everything that we got, you know, in life and in, in love and in business. And 
So now we have, I've created a platform where we could, we could, uh, we could show how dreams and um, possibilities are still something that can be captured if you work hard and, uh, and believe in yourself. You are true, a true inspiration for everyone out there. You have a dream and you make it happen. But it's a dream that keep, keep on giving because we are learning and we're having fun with each episode. So tell us which one is the best story that you remember from all these 300 <clears throat> episodes of American Pickers? Uh, there's so many. I mean, there's been younger people on the show. There's been obviously a lot of older people on the show. I think, you know, uh, people that just people that live simple lives that, um, that don't need much and understand, um, their journey and love their journey and appreciate life for what it is day to day. They don't live outside their world. They live in a world that they created. Um, people like mole man or hippie Tom or hobo Jack, um, you know, uh, those are the people that like have marched to the beat of their own drum and live their life in a way that, um, that honors their past, their family and their community. So I think, uh, you know, for me, it's always the person that, um, is not afraid to be different, not afraid to be, um, off the grid and live their life in a way that, um, that they, they feel is beautiful. And that to me is what the show is focused on. It's showing people different journeys and different paths and that we don't always have to, you know, fit inside of a box to, uh, to have a beautiful life. I think this is a perfect introduction to Daniel. She doesn't need to fit in the picture. She needs to stand out from the picture. <laughs> and one of the things that we love the most, uh, uh, Daniel, about you, we have shared so many good times in Mexico and all over the place. And we love what you add to the show. Mike described it once as the glue of the show. What do you think about that? Are you truly the glue of this show? Yeah, I think I was kind of born the glue of anything. <laughs> Everybody kind of has their, their place and their spot. And uh, I feel like that, I always feel like that's the perfect spot for me. I like to put people together. I like to um, find people who have this thing and people who need this thing and put them together and somehow, you know, just facilitate. I like to just facilitate. You know, that, that's what I'm best at, I think, in life, honestly, <laughs> just facilitating people getting together and, and collaborating and, and doing neat things. I, I like that. And you do it so nicely, so nicely. One thing that we notice is that in episode 297, we have one of your no hidden secrets at all that you like burlesque, and it's called the right. Queen of Burlesque. So tell us about that episode. Oh, I actually have her right behind me, if you see. You see? Uh huh. Yes. So that Perfect. episode <laughs> was so special to me that I, I brought her home to pick. Oh, so, anyway, I have a great friend who is a beautiful Mexican burlesque artist. She happens to live in Cleveland. Um, and she comes across really incredible burlesque items for me from time to time. She came across this beautiful poster of Blaze Fury, who is a burlesque legend from, uh, I mean, she, she traveled north to south and, uh, and all over the country, all over the world. But when I found this poster, it spoke so much to burlesque history and to, you know, just Cleveland history. Um, but I felt that it really spoke to me personally because it was so, um, it was in such a state of bad repair and it really needed to be cleaned up. So since my mother and my father are both in photography, um, my mom used to colorize all the black and white photos back when I was younger and she taught me how to do it. So from my mother and father, I learned how to do that. So I've cleaned her and I've started the colorization process, but I'm flying my parents out so that they can help me with the rest of it because I feel like it would be a really neat heritage project for us. It's a great idea. Now we're going to open for Q and A. Our media outlets from Latin America are dying to talk directly to you guys. So we're going to open the mics for Q and A with Mike and Daniel. Yes, we're going to start with Luciana. Mariana, me ayudas con la primera pregunta. 
Yes, it would be from Luciano Guaral, uh, Guaraldo from Brazil, UOL. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, you know, you guys have been doing this for a while and you're quite good at, quite good at picking by now, but do you ever go to a barn or to a, to a garage sale and it's a complete dead end and absolutely nothing, not even junk comes out of it? Just a waste of time that you don't even bother putting it on, on the show. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's times that I'll go, uh, we'll go pick a place um, and we don't find a lot of things, but the person's journey and there's such a character, their story is, is just as important as the item itself. Danielle and I were fortunate enough to meet a younger gentleman that uh, lived in New Mexico and he was restoring a smaller town and most of the structures were made Adobe style and he, um, he was doing Airbnbs, but only for, uh, not only for, but specifically catered around artists. And we didn't buy a lot of stuff there, but we really captured the idea and a dream of someone that was uh, really climbing a mountain. I mean, this gentleman didn't have a lot of money, but he had a lot of heart and he had a lot of soul. And so the space itself and, and him and his story became the treasure of that of that episode so sometimes it's not really the item if you watch the show it's really really the people and the space because you know we're taking people on a journey of traveling and when they travel with us they see a lot of things that they normally wouldn't see not just items awesome next question please yes from argentina ale rodriguez bodat from radio nacional Gracias, Mariana. Gracias, César. Hi, guys. How are you? It's a really pleasure for Hello. me. Uh, <clears throat> hi, how are you? Congrats on, the, congrats on the 10 years and the 300 episode. So uh, after 10 years, the show, the TV show is, is still more interesting, still more fresh. What's the secret? <laughs> you want that, Danny? <laughs> please tell me the secret. Love, secret man. Please. Love. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's, it's love for what you do. It's love for the people you work with. It's advocating for one another. It's hearing each other when there's a problem. It's uh, working past those problems to try to find creative solutions. It's understanding what's happening in the world and kind of working within what's on, what's happening in the world and, and trying to keep it fresh. But it's interesting because we film these episodes and then it takes about three months to, for an episode to come out, right? After we film it. So the rate the world's moving right now, it's like, it's hard to keep <laughs> up. So I'm glad that it's staying fresh, but I think really it's love for what you do. It's advocate advocating for the people who make and help all of this happen. And it's, you know, really learning from our television audience and, and understanding through social media platforms and other platforms, what y'all want to see. Nice question. Hey, you. Thank, nice you. Thank, you thank you very Let's much. Let's go with the next, Mariana. Yes, it will be from Eduardo Gutierrez from Quien Magazine, Mexico. Hi, hello, how are you? It's such a pleasure to talk to you. Well, I would like to know first, Mike, for you, how great was the thing that you discovered this passion through seek things in the trash first and then look in the history of the people and for you Daniel I would like to know you have the chance to be in here in Mexico and visit the house of Frida Kahlo how connected to you even more with her and how do you feel about it thank you very much to the both of you um for me when I was younger I was always digging in the trash because I was a treasure hunter, like most children are. They want to discover and um, and find things and search out things. So I would find things in the garbage, and a lot of those things would be friends of mine, <laughs> or they would become my play pieces. Um, when I was very little, I walked to school when I was four, and I was picked on. And I was picked on so bad that I did not want to see other people when I walked to school. I tried to find routes on the way to school that um, I could walk where I didn't see anybody. And those routes were between people's houses and they were in the alleys. 
So when I would walk by myself in the alleys and the garage doors were open and the garbage was there and I, it, I was, I was just uh, mesmerized by the things that people would, would throw out. My mom was a single mom raising three children. We never got a dime from my father. And um, I saw things in the garbage that we couldn't afford. And so I would, I would accumulate them and I would take them home. But it got to the point where I was fascinated with just about anything. And um, I remember after Halloween one year, I was probably five years old. I was walking in these alleys and I saw that people were throwing out their jack-o'-lanterns, their pumpkins. And I was amazed by that because that's the coolest thing when you're a kid, when you approach some house, you know, to say trick or treat. <laughs> so I, uh, I got a wagon and I brought all those home to my fort behind my house. I didn't understand as a child that they rotted. So by the time they rotted and I couldn't get in my fort anymore because there were bees all over the place, <laughs> I realized that they, uh, <laughs> that they had an ex expiration date to them. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is, is that um, as a child, I was always fascinated, like we all are, with story and pieces that we discover, and it just never left me. It was always part of my heart, and I'm glad that it didn't because I feel like I'm living in a world sometimes that, um, that uh, I feel special in because I, I've created it myself. And when you're a collector, um, you surround yourself with older things that you love, and, and you can relive moments over and over again. And we love to collect memories with you guys. Thank you so much. Next question, please. Yes, from Colombia, Joaquin Lepele of Cinema Cien. Nice to meet you. I'm a... <laughs> what is the difference Hello. between... Hello. What is the difference between trash and treasure? And tell me, why do you like old toys so much? <laughs> well, look what I'm holding in my hand right now. <laughs> I'm holding this toy airplane. Um, I like old toys because they, they're memories from a, from a past that, um, that our forefathers created, you know, I mean, this, this toy right here says Lindy on it. Um, obviously it's a, it's a piece of memorabilia from Charles Lindbergh's, uh, Epic flight, uh, toys hold history, not just in, uh, families, but they hold history in American history. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm fascinated with anything from different time periods. So toys are just one thing. It could be furniture, it could be textiles, it could be pottery. Um, you know, when you find something that's from a life lived before you, that is very great in me and always will be. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, um, Daniel, they're asking you from Mexico. Why you love Mexico so much again? And why is your special connection with Mexico? Oh, so I... I developed a special connection with Mexico because of my father's love for Mexico. He did some uh, missionary work there when I was younger. I had been there a couple times because my parents took me and there she really taught me about Frida Kahlo. And I spent my whole entire childhood envisioning going to Frida's house, Casa Azul. And it was the most incredible gift when Latin a &E actually took me to Casa Azul. And I got to experience it for myself and, and see that, you know, I, I had kind of uh, blown up this image of Frida in my mind as like this superhuman kind of entity. And then actually seeing her home and seeing her bed and seeing her, her life and her clothes and her paintings and her paintbrushes and it was, I mean, like, it's hard to even put into words. It was a revelation. It was a revelation. And I'll be eternally thankful for that. But I think that's my bond to, to Mexico is, is my love of Frida and Casa Azul. Perfect. Thank you. Mariana, next question. Mike and Daniela are waiting. Yeah, from Brazil, Mariana Arrudas from Folia de San Pablo. Hello. Hello. How are you? 
I want to know yeah. if you received some histories from your fans. If we received history from our fans? Yes, we've yes, really you. Yeah, I mean, we get fans that send us things like they can send us out like a motorcycle catalog or Daniel might get a piece of clothing or Frank might get a toy in the mail. Um, you know, people, when they watch the show, they understand that we truly love what we do. It's not just a television show. It's actually a way of life for all of us. And we're very blessed that they would even send us something that meant so much to them and their family. So I think a lot of people are, you know, get to the point where they realize that they need these things to live beyond them. And they start thinking about what that journey should be. So, uh, yes, over the years, we've gotten some very interesting things, even some <laughs> paintings and uh, drawings and sculpture work and woodworking, uh, woodworking, and I mean, all different types of medium when it comes to art. And a lot of it is so heartfelt, and very thoughtful. And um, every time I look, open some of it, I am amazed by it. But, you know, the stuff that really I connect to is um, when children, children send us things because we get a lot of, a lot of things from children, letters from them and drawings that they do and, and, um, telling us how much they liked the journey that we're on with them. So that's probably what touches my heart the most, you know? And it's neat when they send us items that they've dug up. <clears throat> right, Mike, do you remember when the kids used to come into the store? and they would bring up the bottles that they would dig up by the river, the glass bottles, and they bring those in yeah, and they absolutely. tell us the story. Of, and we pay them for each bottle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Mariana, more questions? Yes, from Argentina, Gabriel Fresta from Radio Sonica. Perfecto. Hello. Hello. Bueno, eh, yo, eh, cada vez que ustedes compran eh, un objeto, eh, hay una relación, cada vez que termina la compra, hay una relación entre costo y beneficio. Los que seguimos el programa, eh, tenemos temor que de pronto haya una acumulación muy grande de objetos en los depósitos eh, y que se les termine el dinero. ¿Cómo es esa relación entre compra y venta? Teniendo en cuenta, Mike, que sos la persona que con alegría toma el objeto, pero la que recibe el objeto en el depósito es Daniel. He would like to know basically what's the, what the, what the cost-benefit relationship when you buy, when you obtain an artifact or a product in the stores. Because he's also very afraid as a fan that sometimes you keep buying. However, Daniel, keep putting everything in the stores. Is any fear that you will become accumulator or a hoarder with so many stuff? <laughs> or you actually able to sell the stuff very quickly and do business with it. They're wondering that. How do you get along okay. with the purchases versus the sales itself? Okay, so we have two stores. We have one in Iowa and one in Nashville. Both of those are in tourism, excuse me, tourism destinations. And so we're very fortunate that we're in areas that people travel to. Um, some of the destination and other times the, the, the community is. Uh, so we have a lot of traffic that go through these stores in Nashville. Uh, we have up to 16 tour buses a day that will travel to our store in Nashville because they're on a tour of Nashville itself, not just coming to us, but Nashville, different destination points. And a lot of people are fans of the show. So we don't really have a problem seeing things per se. Um, I guess the other side of the question he was asking is, you know, when I find things, if I'm falling in love with them and describing them on camera the way I am, is it hard for me to sell? That is getting harder and harder for me to do. Yes, because, um, you know, my tastes have changed and I fall in love with things because of place and, and person. Um, sometimes it's not necessarily the item. It's like where I found it, the journey I was on when I did discover it. So I fall in love with items um, over and over again. And I've said on the show, sometimes I call what I have to do would break up with them, you know, but, um, I, 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 I'm in a house right now that a lot of people, when they come into it, they're like, is this a museum or is this a house? <laughs> Especially my daughter that's nine years old and her friends. But I've always been someone that fascinated. I was fascinated by history and I've always been someone that 
has collected to the point where I've created my own little world with it. So um, a hoarder, I wouldn't say that. I think my, my tastes are more uh, stylish and I can still walk through my house and <laughs> it's not like, um, it's not like I'm walking around <laughs> with Kleenex boxes on my feet and, and I'm, and, I, and I'm out of my mind for these things. I, I just really have a genuine love for them. Check with them in 10 years though. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. From Mexico, Enrique Cruz from La Cronica newspaper. Hi, Mike. Hi, Daniel. How are you doing guys? Good. How are you? I'm, I'm good, guys. And I would like to ask you, I, I know, Mike, as you said uh, a few minutes ago, uh, that you are finding history. You're not only finding items uh, from the garbage, but you are also finding history, like the example of you put of uh, the Bradley motorcycles. And I would like to ask you that. How does it feel to, to, to be part of the history? Because you are finding things that now it are like uh, uh, physical examples from a certain period of history. You know, you are finding something from the early century, the past century. And how does it how does it feel that that you are not uh, you are giving to the people things that you can uh, before you can only see on on, on books and magazines and new and now you are part of that history. How does it feel that, Mike? Well, I mean, the best part of that history is that we're documenting it on television. You know, all of this, all of these journeys are being filmed. So it's one thing to find an item that has never been found before. And every once in a while that happens in our business. It's not like that happens all the time. But when you document it on film, then that becomes a lineage within itself. You know, I mean, I think about people that will watch this show in 20 years and 30 years when maybe a lot of these items that we're finding now can't be found anymore. Um, you know, uh, the journey that we've taken for the last 11 years now filming the show has been um, one of the hardest things that all of us have ever done. Danielle and Frank and I and, and uh, have, myself, we, none of us, you know, we just never been on camera before. So we were kind of learning as we went. And, um, and mm -hmm. so I think when we find something that's so unique and so different, the, our reaction on film is truly uh is truly sincere and i think that that uh that people can understand the, our emotions more and and how we connect because you know you got to remember a lot of people i'd say probably maybe 80 percent of the people that watch our show they don't collect anything they collect nothing they're interested in it because of the journey the stories the characters that are on it us being characters within our, ourselves on it and so you know the documentation of all of this is really what's fascinating to me now after doing it for so long because we've got you know over 300 shows now that um that all of these stories are being documented thank you so much mike excellent Next Peter, are people getting you. into fights let me take yeah, a from, look because i have that from earphone. rodrigo lara from the section comment. cars of uol brazil rodrigo hello Brasil. Hello. Rodrigo, fala. Você está aí? Next well, question, we, we, Mariana. Yeah, no, 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 no. I got, no, I'm, no, I'm, okay. I'm talking. <laughs> Daniel, Mike, nice to meet you and congratulations on the 10 years of the show. It was an awesome time. Uh, I'd like to know what is the rarest and the most expensive car you, you have ever encountered? Um, Mike, the rarest, most expensive would probably be, you know, maybe a Porsche Speedster, something from, you know, before 1960, like 55, 57. That's a very expensive car now. Um, we found a lot of early cars. I'd say the Cadillac that we found in the show, the Madam X, that was a prototype. That car was extremely rare. It had a V8 in it. And, um, that was a very rare car because obviously it was a prototype and uh it was there was documentation of that car with its serial number and the condition of the car and um i think uh, i don't know if you guys have seen the episode yet where it ended up in a museum in utah so that was a very rare car um itself uh, a lot of the cars that we find i think are interesting to people because it's in the in america here when they watch the show it's something that they can find themselves you know, like 1930s and 1940s cars. 
Um, and then obviously the uniqueness of each car with uh, a person that owned it over the years, making it their own, that, that can be, uh, that can be pretty epic and different itself. Thank you. Muito obrigado. Now, Omar Alvarado, Omar Alvarado from Travesía Pop, Colombia. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenos días. Eh, eh, bueno, pues, eh, good morning eh, a, a Mike y, y a Daniel. Hello. Mi pregunta, mi pregunta es eh, que bueno, a través del programa ustedes han encontrado muchos tesoros, eh, pero quizá, quisiera saber si hay, con alguno de ellos se han quedado o alguno que los haya atrapado, que los haya enamorado de los que hemos visto en el programa y que ustedes dijeron, bueno, eso lo quiero no para, para vender como parte del negocio, sino como parte de mi, de mi colección personal. Y la segunda es, eh, ¿cuál es el tesoro que, que más desean o han deseado encontrar y que saben que todavía está en la carretera y que todavía lo siguen buscando? The questions from Colombia are, the first question is like, we know that you have found so many treasures through your road trips around the time. Which one of those you decide to keep because they were so close to your heart? Too many. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it was a Royal Pioneer motorcycle. It's actually in my living room right over there. And it's something that I see every day when I walk in there. Um, that was bought in Florida and it was in pieces. It was made 1910 and There are only four of those motorcycles known to exist. All of them are restored except for the one I own. It's unrestored. And that was easy for me to find and something that I live with every day. For me, it's my burlesque memorabilia. Yeah, for me, my burlesque memorabilia, like roller skating memorabilia because of my years with roller derby. Um, th those two things are hard to get rid of for sure. And like, I'm sure that I probably will never get rid of Blaze Fury. And the second question was, which one is the treasure that you know is out there that you really, really want it and you don't have it yet? <laughs> uh, for me, That's it's a Blackhawk motorcycle. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. The motorcycle, which one? A Blackhawk motorcycle it was made in Rock Island, Illinois. There's been two engines found. No one's ever found. Like, I'd love to be able to find that someday and be the person to uh, to own such an amazing piece of American transportation history. And it's from our community where we're from. It's from the area that we're from. So I think that would be something that I've always dreamed of finding. What about you, Daniel? I have a I have a dream of finding one piece of a costume set. Uh, that I purchased about five years ago. And I have I've purchased the entire costume set over the last five years, piece by piece. And there's one piece that's missing. And in this incredible story, uh, this burlesque dancer named Lorraine Gale Smith, who used to work in the combat zone in Boston, was, was you know, murdered the night she got off of work. And the one piece I'm missing from her collection is the black ostrich feather dressing gown she wore on stage that night. I have the white one she wore, but I can't find the black one and I'm wondering what happened to it. So it's very specific, but that's what I would love to <laughs> so It's a black hawk motorcycle for Michael and it's the black ostrich feather for Daniel. Perfect, <laughs> let's go to the next question. Yeah. Yes, from Argentina, Leticia Pomo from Caras Magazine. Hello. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Qué lindo conocerlos, Daniela. y eh, Daniel, te quería preguntar a vos, ¿es innato el valor de las cosas? ¿Se aprende a conocer, a saber el valor de cada uno de los objetos? Daniel, this question is for you from Argentina, from Caras Magazine. She would like to know, is something that you learn or something that's already inside of you to give and to know the price of the objects and the artifacts that you found around the, the way? Uh, no, you know, honestly, the, the thing that I learned from Mike is to pick what you love 
And if you pick what you love, you can never go wrong because if you get stuck with it, then you can just love it in your house, right? So if you pay too much money, at least you love what you picked. Um, and it does happen sometimes where you pay a little bit too much. Um, I am, as Mike says, again, like you pay for your mistakes and you pay for your education. Um, you know, nothing, nothing's free in this, in this piece of, uh, vintage, you know, it, it takes money to learn how to make money sometimes. So it's, it's not something that's born into me. I specifically know burlesque history and circus and sideshow history. And so that stuff I can be sharp with, but there's a lot of stuff that I have to actually look. Thank you. Um, hay alguna otra pregunta más? Creo que de Brasil, Mariana. Yes, Ederly Fortunato from Journal 140 Brazil. Hello. Brazil. Hello, <laughs> Thank you for your time. And Thank you. My, my question is about uh, the older people we see every time in the way you, I feel a lot of respect. You respect them a lot. And also, you know, uh, Mike, you know a lot about the, every object, every toy, every motorcycle. And I want to know how much you have to study to know so much about the objects and also about your care and respect for the other people who you visit. I feel a lot that you respect them a lot. So I'd like to know about that. Thank you. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, ever since I was young, I think I don't can I can never really remember being young. I've always had an old soul and a lot of the people that I would um, congregate towards in my neighborhood growing up were older people that were always sitting on their porches, uh, especially the ones that treated me as an equal and tr not not treated me like a child. They would talk to me and have conversations with me um, like I was their age, you know, like an old friend. And so, you know, as I get older and my mother gets older and the people around me get older, my mentors, you know, get older. I realize that um, life is short and very fleeting and, you know, having children, you know, that kind of changes your perspective on time. Um, you know, all of the people that have filmed with us over the years, they're the ones that have kept this show on the air really, truly, you know, I mean, we've been the conduit for them, you know, to be able to tell their story and find these items, you know, in their, in their possessions, but, you know, their stories and, um, are really what I think people tune in for. So for us, we are, uh, we're the vehicle for them to just uh, express themselves. You know, we're giving them a chance to express themselves in a way that no one else has ever done before. And so for me, the older people um, that we film with are, are just as precious or more, way more precious than the items that we find them are. Uh, I, uh, some of my best friends in this community are in their seventies, you know, where I live here now. So, um, it's a, it, it's a, it's a level of respect and care that I think that we all need to reflect on, you know, uh, as we live our lives and golder together. Now we want to say, uh, first and foremost, um, thank you. Thank you, sir. we want to thank you because I think it was a very special encounter. And um, for the first time, we were able not only to find the TV characters, but especially amazing people with amazing hearts. It was very nice, and we feel very privileged, Mike and Daniel, that you share stories about your childhood, but especially your mothers. It seems that both of you have been influenced by your mothers in a very special way that we can feel in our hearts. And also, we want to know that, tell you that, I know you have spent more than 20 years looking for treasures in all kinds of places, but you found more than 70 million treasures in Latin America, because we are more than 70 million fans that we love every episode of American Pickers, and we want to follow you and we all the you. way. 
We love you. We appreciate so please you. Please appreciate your support. Provide so us your final words before we say goodbye. We want to listen and hear from you, Mike. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. We're speaking in every language that we have, but especially from the language of the heart. We want to say thank you for making history. Thank you for creating these memories for us and with us. Mike, you go first, please. Um, thank you for saying that. It's it's an honor to be here. I, uh, I was never much of a history student myself. I was always someone that learned hands-on, and I was always someone that that learned from people that um, cared and and um, had a passion. If someone had a passion and they were willing to explain and express themselves to me, then I always wanted to learn from somebody like that. Um, I've been very fortunate in my life to be able to have the platform that I do to share stories. Um, really, I truly, truly believe that this is a show about all of us. And today, having these interviews with all of you is 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 really is really um, a beautiful thing because you know with the world the way it is right now and um, the fast pace that we all live in, and I think we forget that uh, you know we're all really truly here to take care of each other, and so it is a blessing to me that I'm in everyone's homes there or in your hearts and trust me you guys are in our hearts too we i think about now as we make the show all the people from all over to watch it and how important it is for all of us to understand our community and our family's history i mean through this pandemic you know you were our eyes out there and you were able to tell us the stories that we were not able to reach so we really appreciate it more than anything and more than everything these special stories and that the emotional connection that you have with Latin American Brazil is very special to our hearts as well. Daniel, your turn, please. I, you know, I just cut. Mike, you made me emotional. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess um, the last year has just been really, really uh, mind blowing, right? And it's really given me an opportunity to kind of look back on the last 10 years, 11 years, 12 years, really, that we've been putting this together uh, so that you can see for the last 10 years. Um, and just seeing how much each of us has grown and changed and embraced change and embraced the uh, discomfort of learning when we're wrong about one thing and we need to course correct and figure out a, a better way of doing things um, with business, with relationships, with, with all of it. And I think that that's what I'm the most thankful for is that everybody has watched us go through all of these crazy changes and um, that we have been able to build a world that we love and have had so much support from everybody in the process of it. Um, I think that uh, what Mike said about really understanding and respecting the elders in your community is huge. You're not always going to see eye to eye. You're not always going to understand each other's stories. But the stories are there for a reason. And it's good to listen to each other and it's good to be able to vocalize and learn from each other and teach each other and, and not ever feel like you're the smartest person in the room. Because if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. So I, I think this is about community. And and I, that's my takeaway from the last year is that this is about community. And I'm really thankful to have the community with Mike. Uh, still one of my best friends after all these years. And that's so rare. And um, I'm really fortunate to have such a wonderful audience and support from all of you, I, I, y'all have treated me so kind and lovingly, and I just uh, am thankful every day. Guys, if Katie? I could just a couple words, uh, so just co a, co a couple of closing words, uh, just like you guys have your team. We have our team here. It's not just myself and Cesar and Miguel. We have a whole bunch of people throughout Latin America that uh, um, our goal is to take care of you guys. Uh, 
as a show, as individuals, you know, we present you and we represent you uh, in a way that that we believe that 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 you would want to be presented and represented. Um, you know, from from day one, we take a lot of care. We make sure that uh, everything we communicate to the journalist, to the public, is done uh, with a lot of a care, with a lot of heart. And uh, there's a lot of people, and, and you know, we have offices in Mexico, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Bogota, even Caracas. Um, uh, all our voiceover people, everybody that represents you, um, you know, they they take heart uh, at the work that they do. And we just hope that you know we, you know, not, you know we've made you we've made you quite famous in Latin America. You know you've made yourself famous, but but our team has, has had a lot to do with uh, making American Pickers uh, a household name in, in in Latin America. So thank you for your time, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you for, for believing us. Thank you for believing. Don't us. worry, Mike and Daniel. We are already preparing the tickets. Whenever you are ready to come to Miami or to Latin America, <laughs> we will be your travel agency. So thank you so much. Uh, blessings to all. And remember, next week we're going yeah. to see each other to watch history, Mark of the Empire history too. But please don't miss, no se pierda. Yes, we're going to, vamos a tener el evento de Misterios de Asia directamente en Singapur a las 6 de la tarde. No se pierdan American Pickers, Cazadores de Reliquias en América Latina en la temporada número 17, episodio 300 muy pronto. Sigamos haciendo historia con el mejor entretenimiento. Gracias y hasta la próxima. Gracias por el apoyo. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We love you. Bye, guys. We love you, love you guys. Take care. Aunque parezca cosa de niños, coleccionar buenos recuerdos es un trabajo serio. Mike y Frank tienen todos los juguetes. Así como lo oyes. Bolas, artefactos, bicicletas, motocicletas, de pedal, objetos militares, oh. bifurtaciones, pistolas de juguete. Cazadores de Tesoros. Nuevos episodios. Domingo a las 11 y 30 de la noche. Disponible en History Play y History on Demand. Simples trucos que todo amante de los viajes tiene que conocer. Tengan cuidado, Adiós. cinturones de seguridad. Saca provecho a tu GPS. Siga hacia el oeste por 2.974 kilómetros. Comparte con alguien tu felicidad. No existe pie grande, amigo. Supongo que me aguarás la fiesta ahora y dirás que no existe el monstruo del lago Ness. <risa> Vive recuerdos inolvidables. Ha llegado a su destino. Dijo que tenía su sí. primer stand Lee a vapor y está adentro. Está adentro. Es increíble. Aquí, justo oh, aquí. Allá está. Cazadores de tesoros. Todos los martes a las 10 y 35 de la noche. Disponible en History Play y History on Demand. Cuando crees que has terminado, encuentras otra cosa. Frank, ayúdame con esto. Tiene toneladas de cosas. Oh, oh sí, sí. sí. La tengo. Eh, vamos. Uno, dos, Uno, dos. Tres. Listo, ah. adelante. Este cartel abre el apetito. Yo le advertía a la gente el peligro que había en algunas calles. Trabajé con los primeros automóviles modelo T. Yo jugaba con los niños en los años 30. Sería bueno que las cosas hablaran, ¿no? Hasta entonces, acude a Frank y Mike para conocer las memorias de los objetos. Son geniales porque tenías que tener imaginación. Volarlos por el aire. Porque el verdadero valor de una pieza... 735. Muy bien. Está en su historia. Cazadores de tesoros. Solo por History.